Ah, Are You Digging on My Grave? by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by William Mesqueda. Ah, are you digging on my grave, my loved one, planting rue? No, yesterday he went to wed one of the brightest wealth has bred. It cannot hurt her now, he said, that I should not be true. Then who is digging on my grave, my nearest, dearest kin? Ah, no, they sit and think, what use? What good will planting flowers produce? No tendance of her mound can loose her spirit from death's gin. But someone digs upon my grave, my enemy, prodding sly? Nay, when she heard you had passed the gate that shuts on all flesh soon or late, she thought you no more worth her hate, and cares not where you lie. Then who is digging on my grave? Say, since I have not guessed. Oh, it is I, my mistress dear, your little dog who still lives near and much I hope my movements here have not disturbed your rest. Ah, yes, you dig upon my grave. Why flashed it not to me that one true heart was left behind? What feeling do we ever find to equal among humankind a dog's fidelity? Mistress, I dug upon your grave to bury a bone in case I should be hungry near this spot when passing on my daily trot. I am sorry, but I quite forgot it was your resting place. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Arbor Day from Black Beetles in Amber by Ambrose Bierce. Read for LibriVox.org by Dale Grothman. Hasten, children, black and white, celebrate the yearly rite. Every pupil plant a tree. It will grow some day to be big and strong enough to bear a school director hanging there. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Arithmetic on the Frontier by Rudyard Kipling. Read for LibriVox.org by J. Saka. A great and glorious thing it is to learn for seven years or so. The Lord knows what of that and this ere reckoned fit to face the foe. The flying bullet down the pass that whistles clear, all flesh is grass. Three hundred pounds per annum spent on making brain and body meter. For all the murderous intent comprised in villainous saltpeter, and after, ask the Yusufazes what comes of all our ologies. A scrimmage in a border station, a counter down some dark defile, two thousand pounds of education drops to a ten rupee jizile. The crammer's boast, the squadron's pride, shot like a rabbit in a ride. No proposition Euclid wrote, no formulae the textbooks know, will turn the bullet from your coat, or ward the tulwar's downward blow. Strike hard who cares, shoot straight who can, the odds are on the cheaper man. One sword not stolen from the camp will pay for all the school expenses of any Kurum Valley scamp who knows no word of moods and tenses, but being blessed with perfect sight picks off our messmates left and right. With homebred hordes the hillsides team, the troop ships bring us one by one, at vast expense of time and steam, to slay Aphrodite's where they run. The captives of our bow and spear are cheap, alas, as we are dear. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Barter by Sarah Teasdale. Read for LibriVox.org by Amanda Grace Waugh. Life has loveliness to sell, all beautiful and splendid things, blue waves whitened on a cliff, soaring fire that sways and sings, and children's faces looking up, holding wonder like a cup. Life has loveliness to sell, music like a curve of gold, scent of pine trees in the rain, eyes that love you, arms that hold. 
and for your spirits still delight holy thoughts that star the night. Spend all you have for loveliness, buy it and never count the cost. For one white singing hour of peace, count many a year of strife well lost. And for a breath of ecstasy, give all you have been or could be. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Bereavement from Shapes of Clay by Ambrose Bierce Read for LibriVox.org by Dale Grothman A countess, so they tell the tale, who dwelt of old in Arno's Vale, where ladies, even of high degree, know more of love than ABC, came once with a prodigious bribe unto the learned village scribe, that most discreet and honest man who wrote for all the lover clan, nor e'er a secret had betrayed, save when inadequately paid. Write me, she sobbed, I pray thee do, a book about the Prince de Gieu, a book of poetry and praise of all his works and all his ways, the godlike grace of his address, his more than woman's tenderness, his courage stern and lack of guile, the loves that wantoned in his smile so great he was so rich and kind i'll not within a fortnight find his equal as a lover oh my god i shall be drowned in woe what prince de Gieu has died exclaimed the honest man for letters famed and while he pocketed her gold of what if i may be so bold fresh storms of tears the lady shed i stabbed him fifty times she said End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Bereft, She Thinks She Dreams by Thomas Hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Quaker Woodworker I dream that the dearest I ever knew has died and been entombed. I'm sure it's a dream that cannot be true, but I am so overgloomed by its persistence that I would gladly have quick death take me rather than longer think thus sadly. So wake me, wake me. It has lasted days, but minute and hour I expect to get aroused and find him as usual in the bower where we so happily housed yet stays this nightmare too appalling, and like a web shakes me, and piteously I keep on calling, and no one wakes me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Blight by Edna St. Vincent Millay Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Hard seeds of hate I planted that should by now be grown, Rough stalks, and from thick stamens a poisonous pollen blown, And odors rank, unbreathable, from dark corollas thrown. At dawn from my damp garden I shook the chilly dew, The thin boughs locked behind me that sprang to let me through, The blossoms slept, I sought a place when nothing lovely grew. And there, when day was breaking, I knelt and looked around. The light was near, the silence was palpitant with sound. I drew my hate from out my breast and thrust it in the ground. Oh, ye so fiercely tended, ye little seeds of hate, I bent above your growing early and noon and late, Yet are ye drooped and pitiful, I cannot rear ye straight. The sun seeks out my garden, no nook is left in shade, No mist, nor mould, nor mildew endures on any blade. Sweet rain slants under every bough, ye falter, and ye fade. End of poem this recording is in the public domain.
The Blossom by John Donne, read for LibriVox.org by Frédéric Surget. Little thinkest thou, poor flower, when I have watched six or seven days, and seen thy birth, and seen what every hour gave to thy growth, thee to this height to raise, and now dost laugh and triumph on this path. Little thinkest thou that it will freeze anon, and that I shall to-morrow find thee fallen or not at all. Little thinkest thou, poor heart, that laborest yet to nestle thee, and thinkest by hovering here to get apart in a forbidden or forbidding tree, and hopest her stiffness by long siege to bow. Little thinkest thou, and thou, to-morrow, ere the sun doth wake, must with the sun a mere journey take. But thou which lovest to be subtle to plague thyself, wilt I say, Alas, if you must go, what's that to me? Here lies my business, and here will I stay. You go to friends whose love and means present various content to your eyes, ears, and taste, and every part. If then your body go, what need your heart? Well then, stay here. But know when thou hast said and done thy most, a naked thinking heart that makes no show is to a woman but a kind of ghost. How shall she know my heart? Or having none, know thee for one. Practice may make her know some other part, but take my word, she doth not know a heart. Meet me in London, then, twenty days hence, and thou shalt see me fresher and more fat, by being with men, than if I had stayed still with her and thee. For God's sake, if you can, be you so too. I will give you there to another friend, whom you shall find as glad to have my body as my mind. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The City of Golganuza by William Blake, from Vala, or the Four Zoas, first published in 1893 by William Butler Yeats. Read for LibriVox.org Los walks round the walls night and day. He views the city of Golganuza and its smaller cities, the looms and mills and prisons and workhouses of Og and Anak, the Amalekite, the Canaanite, the Moabite, the Egyptian, and all that has existed in the space of six thousand years, permanent and not lost, not lost nor vanished, and every little act, word, work, and wish that has existed all remaining still in those churches ever consuming and ever building by the spectres of all the inhabitants of earth wailing to be created shadowy to those who dwell not in them mere possibilities but to those who enter into them they seem the only substances for everything exists and not one sigh nor smile nor tear one hair one particle of dust not one can pass away end of poem this recording is in the public domain the cloud by alexander pushkin translated by ivan pannon read for LibriVox.org by josh kibbe o oh, last cloud of the scattered storm Alone thou sailest along the azure clear, Alone thou bringest the shadow sombre, Alone thou marrest the joyful day. Thou but recently hadst encircled the sky, When sternly the lightning was winding about thee. Thou gavest forth mysterious thunder, With rain hast watered the parched earth. Enough! High thyself! Thy time hath passed! Earth is refreshed! The storm hath fled! And the breeze, fondling the tree's leaves, Forth thee chases from the quieted heavens. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Contentment by Oliver Wendell Holmes, Sr. 
Read for LibriVox.org by Ruth Giddard. Contentment by Oliver Wendell Holmes, Sr. Man wants but little here below. Little I ask, my wants are few. I only wish a hut of stone. A very plain brown stone will do, that I may call my own. And close at hand is such a one, and yonder street that fronts the sun. Plain food is quite enough for me. Three courses are as good as ten. If nature can subsist on three, thank heaven for three. Amen. I always thought cold victual nice. My choice would be vanilla ice. I care not much for gold or land. Give me a mortgage here and there. Some good bank stock, some note of hand, or trifling railroad share. I only ask that fortune send a little more than I shall spend. Honors are silly toys, I know, and titles are but empty names. I would perhaps be plentiful, but only near St. James. I'm very sure I should not care to fill our gubernator's chair. Jewels are baubles, tis a sin, to care for such unfruitful things. One good-sized diamond in a pin, some not so large in rings. A ruby and a pearl or so will do for me, I laugh at show. My dame should dress in cheap attire, good heavy silks are never dear. I own perhaps I might desire some shawls of true cashmere, some marrowy crepes of china silk like wrinkled skins on scalded milk. I would not have the horse I drive so fast that folks must stop and stare. An easy gait, 245, suits me, I do not care. Perhaps for just a single spurt, some seconds less would do no hurt. Of pictures, I should like to own Titian's and Raphael's three or four. I love so much their style and tone, one turner and no more. A landscape, foreground golden dirt, the sunshine painted with a squirt. Of books but few, some fifty score, for daily use and bound for wear. The rest upon an upper floor, some little luxury there. Of red Morocco's gilded gleam and vellum rich as country cream. Busts, cameos, gems, such things as these, which others often show for pride, I value for their power to please and selfish churls deride. One Stradivarius, I confess, two meerschaums I would fain possess. Wealth's wasteful tricks I will not learn, nor ape the glittering upstart fool. Shall not carved tables serve my turn, but all must be a fool? Give grasping pomp its double share, I ask but one recumbent chair. Thus humble let me live and die, nor long for Midas' golden touch. If heaven more generous gifts deny, I shall not miss them much. Too grateful for the blessing lent of simple taste and mind content. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Daughters of Beulah by William Blake from Vala or the Four Zoas. Read for LibriVox.org. There is from great eternity a mild and pleasant rest named Beulah, a soft, moony universe, feminine, lovely, pure, mild and gentle, given in mercy to all those who sleep eternally created by the lamb of god around on all sides within and without the universal man the daughters of beulah follow after sleepers in their dreams creating spaces lest they fall into eternal death the circle of destiny complete they give to it a space named the space uro brooded over it in care and love they said the spectre is in every man insane and most deformed through the three heavens descending in fury and fire we meet it with our songs and loving blandishments and give to it a form of vegetation but this spectre of tharmas is eternal death what shall we do o oh god pity and help so spoke they, and closed the gate of the tongue in trembling fear. End of poem. This recording is in the public 
domain delight in disorder by robert herrick read for LibriVox.org by colleen mcmahon a sweet disorder in the dress kindles in clothes a wantonness a lawn about the shoulders thrown into a fine distraction an erring lace which here and there enthralls the crimson stomacher a cuff neglectful and thereby ribbons to flow confusedly a winning wave deserving note in the tempestuous petticoat a careless shoestring in whose tie i see a wild civility do more bewitch me than when art is too precise in every part end of poem this recording is in the public domain early away by edward moriki translated by charles wharton stalk read for LibriVox.org by newgate novelist the morning frost shines grey along the misty field beneath the pallid way of early dawn revealed amid the glow one sees the day star disappear yet o'er the western trees the moon is shining clear so too i send my glance on distant scenes to dwell i see in torturing trance the night of our farewell blue eyes a lake of bliss swim dark before my sight thy breath i feel thy kiss i hear thy whispering light my cheek upon thy breast the streaming tears bedew till purple black is cast a veil across my view the sun comes out he glows and straight my dreams depart while from the cliffs he throws a chill across my heart end of poem this recording is in the public domain easter by edmund spencer read for LibriVox.org by larry wilson most glorious lord of life that on this day didst make thy triumph over death and sin and having harrowed hell didst bring away captivity then captive us to win this glorious day dear lord with joy begin and grant that we for whom thou didst die being with thy dear blood clean washed from sin may live for ever in felicity and that thy love we wane worthily may likewise love thee for the same again and for thy sake that all like dear didst buy with love may one another entertain so let us love dear love like as we ought love is the lesson which the lord has taught in the poem this recording is in the public domain elegy by d h lawrence read for librivox dot org by winston tharp the sun immense and rosy must have sunk and become extinct the night you closed your eyes for ever against me gray days and wan dree dawnings since then with fritter of flowers day wearies me with its ostentation and fawnings still you left me the nights the great dark glittery window the bubble hemming this empty existence with lights still in the vast hollow like a breath in a bubble spinning brushing the stars goes my soul that skims the bounds like a swallow i can look through the film of the bubble night to where you are through the film I can almost touch you. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Enough by Sarah Teasdale, read for LibriVox.org by Helen Ferrara for Jean. It is enough for me by day to walk the same bright earth with him. Enough that over us by night the same great roof of stars is dim. I do not hope to bind the wind or set a fetter on the sea. It is enough to feel his love blow by like music over me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Forsaken Maiden by Edward Muriki, translated by Charles Wharton Stork, read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist. Early when cocks do crow, ere the stars dwindle, down to the hearth I go, fire must I kindle. Fair leap the flames on high, sparks they whirl drunken. I watch them listlessly, in sorrow sunken. Sudden it comes to me, youth so fair seeming, that all the night of thee I have been dreaming. Tears then on tears do run for my false lover. Thus has the day begun, would it were over. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Frog by Hilaire Belloc from the Bad Child's Book of Beasts Read for LibriVox.org by Cleve Callison March 19, 2019, Wilmington, North Carolina Be kind and tender to the frog, and do not call him names as Slimy Skin, or Polly Wog, or likewise Ugly James, or Gap a Grin, or Toad Gone Wrong, or Bill Bandy Knees. The frog is justly sensitive to epithets like these. No animal will more repay a treatment kind and fair. At least so lonely people say, who keep a frog, and by the way, they are extremely rare. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Garden by Gertrude Huntington McGifford Read for LibriVox.org by Josh Kibbe Old gardens have a language of their own, and mine sweet speech to linger in the heart. A goodly place it is, and primely spaced, with straight box-bordered paths and squares of bloom. Bay trees by rows of antique urns tell tales of one who loved the gardens Dante loved. Magnolias edge the placid lily pool and flank the sagging seat whence vista leads to blaze of rhododendrons banked in green. Azaleas by the scarlet quince flame up against the lustrous grapevines trellised high to pigeon coat an old brick wall where hide first snowdrops and the bravest violets. A place of solitudes whose silences enfold the heart as an unquiet bird. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Hymns and Anthems Sung at Wellesley College by Caroline Hazard Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson 1. Mount Carmel Where art thou, O my Lord? Mount Carmel saw the throng of priests and heard the song. To Baal was their call, from morn till night did fall. Where art thou, O my Lord? Again Mount Carmel heard, not in the spoken word, not in the earthquake's shock, not in the thunder roll, but in the inmost soul. 2. Vesper Hymn Send peaceful sleep, O Lord, this night, to keep us till the morning light, and let no vision of alarm come near to do thy children harm. Within thy circling arms we lie, O God, in thine infinity. Our souls in quiet shall abide, beset with love on every side. 3. This is that bread. This is that bread that came down from heaven. He that eateth of this bread shall live for ever. Bread on which angels feed. Bread for the spirit's need. By faith receiving, new life do thou impart. New strength to every heart. Pure love of God thou art, to us believing. 4. Slow of heart. O slow of heart to believe, 
ought christ not to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory quicken lord my fainting heart touch my eyes that they may see let me know thee as thou art life and immortality five all hail to thee child jesus all hail to thee child jesus as the brooding darkness flies as the swift approach of day son of righteousness arise chase the gloom of night away great prince of peace come to thine own and build in every heart thy throne come to shed thy healing balm on all the nations of the earth child jesus come with holy calm we will hail thy wondrous birth great prince of peace come to thine own and build in every heart thy throne all hail to thee child jesus six the winepress who is this that comes from edom in such glorious array with his festal garments gleaming travelling on his royal way with a face majestic calm and grave i that speak in righteousness mighty to save why is thy apparel crimson why is all thy garments pride stained as in the time of vintage and with blood red colour dyed because of helpers i had none i have trodden the winepress alone seven waken shepherds angels hosanna 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 shepherds waken shepherds waken whence this glowing light ere the dawn of morning solemn signs of warning portent of affright angels courage shepherds courage banish your dismay for ye all are saved in the town of david christ is born to-day shepherds hearken shepherds hearken hear the angels sing jehovah sends a token he himself hath spoken to proclaim our king angels hasten shepherds hasten this shall be your sign where the kine are stabled in a manger cradle lies the child divine shepherds and angels angels shepherds people shout the glad refrain joy to every nation bringing full salvation christ has come to reign hosanna 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 end of poem this recording is in the public domain I Care Not for These Ladies by Thomas Campion Read for LibriVox.org by Colleen McMahon I care not for these ladies that must be wooed and prayed. Give me kind Amaryllis, the wanton country maid. Nature art disdaineth, her beauty is her own. Her, when we court and kiss, she cries, forsooth, let go. But when we come where comfort is, she never will say no. If I love Amaryllis, she gives me fruit and flowers. But if we love these ladies, we must give golden showers. Give them gold that sell love. Give me the nut-brown lass, who, when we court and kiss, she cries, forsooth, let go. But when we come where comfort is, she never will say no. These ladies must have pillows and beds by strangers wrought. Give me a bower of willows, of moss and leaves unbought and fresh amaryllis with milk and honey fed who when we court and kiss she cries forsooth let go but when we come where comfort is she never will say no end of poem this recording is in the public domain i hear an army charging upon the land by james joyce read for LibriVox.org by winston tharp i hear an army charging upon the land and the thunder of horses plunging foam about their knees arrogant in black armor behind them stand disdaining the reins with fluttering whips the charioteers they cry unto the night their battle name i moan in sleep when i hear afar their whirling laughter they cleave the gloom of dreams, a blinding flame, clanging, clanging upon the heart as upon an anvil. They come shaking in triumph their long green hair. They come out of the sea and run, shouting by the shore, My heart, have you no wisdom thus to despair? My love, my love, my love, why have you left me alone? 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. In the Garden by F. S. Flint Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp The grass is beneath my head, and I gaze at the thronging stars in the aisles of night. They fall, they fall, I am overwhelmed and afraid. Each little leaf of the aspen is caressed by the wind, and each is crying and the perfume of invisible roses deepens the anguish. Let a strong mesh of roots feed the crimson of roses upon my heart, and then fold over the hollow where all the pain was. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. John Brown's Song by Henry Howard Brownell, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. John Brown's Song, words that can be sung to the Hallelujah chorus. Old John Brown lies a mouldering in the grave. Old John Brown lies slumbering in his grave. But John Brown's soul is marching with the brave. His soul is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His soul is marching on. He has gone to be a soldier in the army of the Lord. He's sworn as a private in the ranks of the Lord. He shall stand at Armageddon with his brave old sword when heaven is marching on glory glory hallelujah glory glory hallelujah glory glory hallelujah for heaven is marching on he shall file in front where the lines of battle form he shall face to front when the squares of battle form Time with the column and charge in the storm where men are marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. True men are marching on. Ah, foul tyrants, do you hear him where he comes? Ah, black traitors, do you know him as he comes? In thunder of the cannon and roll of the drums As we go marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. We all are marching on. Men may die and moulder in the dust. Men may die and arise again from dust. Shoulder to shoulder in the ranks of the just when heaven is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. The Lord is marching on. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Journey by Edna St. Vincent Millay. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Ah, could I lay me down in this long grass? and close my eyes, and let the quiet wind blow over me. I am so tired, so tired of passing pleasant places. All my life, following care along the dusty road, have I looked back at loveliness and sighed. Yet at my hand an unrelenting hand tugged ever, and I passed. 
All my life long, over my shoulder have I looked at peace, and now I fain would lie in this long grass and close my eyes. Yet onward, catbirds call through the long afternoon, and creeks at dusk are guttural. Whippoorwills wake and cry, drawing the twilight close about their throats. Only my heart makes answer. Eager vines go up the rocks and wait. Flushed apple trees pause in their dance and break the ring for me. Dim, shady wood roads, redolent of fern and bayberry, that through sweet bevy's thread of round-faced roses, pink and petulant, look back and beckon ere they disappear. Only my heart, only my heart responds. Yet, ah, my path is sweet on either side all through the dragging day, sharp underfoot and hot, and like dead mist the dry dust hangs. But far, oh, far as passionate eye can reach, and long, ah, long as rapturous eye can cling, the world is mine. Blue hill, still silver lake, broad field, bright flower, and the long white road, a gateless garden, and an open path, my feet to follow, and my heart to hold. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mid March by Lizette Woodworth Reese. Read for LibriVox.org by Colleen McMahon. It is too early for white bows, too late for snows. From out the hedge the wind lets fall a few last flakes, ragged and delicate. Down the stripped roads the maples start their small, soft, wildering fires. Stained are the meadow stalks a rich and deepening red. The willow tree is woolly. In deserted garden walks the lean bush crouching hints old royalty feels some june stir in the sharp air and knows soon twill leap up and show the world a rose the days go out with shouting nights are loud wild warring shapes the wood lifts in the cold the moon's a sword of keen barbaric gold plunged to the hilt in a pitch black cloud end of poem this recording is in the public domain My Sweetest Lesbia, inspired in part by the Roman poet Catullus, by Thomas Campion, read for LibriVox.org by Cleve Callison, Wilmington, North Carolina, March 28, 2019. My Sweetest Lesbia, let us live and love, and though the sager sort our deeds reprove, let us not weigh them. Heaven's great lamps do dive into their west and straight again revive. But soon as once set is our little light, then we must sleep one ever-during night. If all would lead their lives in love like me, then bloody swords and armor should not be. No drum nor trumpet peaceful sleep should move, unless alarm came from the camp of love. But fools do live and waste their little light and seek with pain their ever-during night. When timely death my life and fortune ends, let not my hearse be vexed with mourning friends, but let all lovers, rich in triumph, come and with sweet pastimes grace my happy tomb. And, Lesbia, close up thou my little light, and crown with love my ever-during night. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Nemesis by H. P. Lovecraft. Read for LibriVox.org by Flamboyant Otter. Through the ghoul guarded gateways of slumber, past the wan mooned abysses of night, I have lived o'er my lives without number, I have sounded all things with my sight, and I struggle and shriek ere the daybreak, being driven to madness with fright. I have whirled with the earth at the dawning, when the sky was a vaporous flame, I have seen the dark universe yawning, 
where the black planets roll without aim, where they roll in their horror unheeded, without knowledge or luster or name. I had drifted o'er seas without ending, under sinister gray-clouded skies, that the many-forked lightning is rending, that resound with hysterical cries, with the moans of invisible demons that out of the green waters rise. I have plunged like a deer through the arches of the hoary primordial grove, where the oaks feel the presence that marches and stalks on where no spirit dares rove. And I flee from a thing that surrounds me and leers through dead branches above. I have stumbled by cave-ridden mountains that rise barren and bleak from the plain. I have drunk of the fog-fetid mountains that ooze down to the marsh in the main. And in hot cursed tarns I have seen things I care not to gaze on again. I have scanned the vast ivy-clad palace, I have trod its untenanted hall, where the moon rising up from the valleys shows the tapestried things on the wall, strange figures discordantly woven that I cannot endure to recall. I have peered from the casements in wonder at the moldering meadows around, at the many-roofed village lay under, the curse of a grave-girdled ground, and from rows of white urn carven marble I listen intently for sound. I have haunted the tombs of the ages, I have flown on the pinions of fear, where the smoke-belching Erebus rages, where the jokels loom snow-clad and drear, and in realms where the sun of the desert consumes what it never can cheer. I was old when the pharaohs first mounted, the jewel-decked throne by the Nile. I was old in those epics uncounted, when I, and I only, was vile. And man, yet untainted and happy, dwelt in bliss on the far arctic isle. O oh, great was the sin of my spirit, and great is the reach of its doom. Not the pity of heaven can cheer it, nor can respite be found in the tomb. Down the infinite eons come beating the wings of unmerciful gloom. Through the ghoul-guarded gateways of slumber, past the wan-mooned abysses of night, I have lived o'er my lives without number, I have sounded all things with my sight, and I struggle and shriek ere the daybreak, being driven to madness with fright. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Passing of the Back House by James Whitcomb Riley. Read for LibriVox.org by Jim Nienaber. When memory keeps me company and moves to smile or tears, a weather-beaten object looms through the mist of years. Behind the house and barn it stood a half a mile or more, and hurrying feet a path had made straight to its swinging door. Its architecture was a type of simple classic art, but in the tragedy of life it played a leading part and oft the passing traveller drove slow and heaved a sigh to see the modest hired girl slip out with glances shy. We had our posy garden that the women loved so well. I loved it too, but better still I loved the stronger smell that filled the evening breezes so full of homely cheer and told the night o'ertaken tramp that human life was near. On lazy August afternoons it made a little bower delightful, where my grandsire sat and whiled away an hour. For there the summer mornings its very cares entwined, and berry bushes reddened in the streaming soil behind. All day fat spiders spun their webs to catch the buzzing flies that flitted to and from the house where Ma was baking pies and once a swarm of hornets bold had built their palace there, and stung my unsuspecting aunt, I must not tell you where. My father took a flaming pole, that was a happy day. He nearly burned the building up, but the hornets left to stay. When summer bloom began to fade and winter to carouse, 
we banked the little building with a heap of hemlock boughs but when the crust is on the snow and sullen skies were gray inside the building was no place where one could wish to stay we did our duties promptly there one purpose swayed the mind we tarried not nor lingered long on what we left behind the torture of the icy seat would make a spartan sob for needs must scrape the flesh with a lacerating cob that from a frost encrusted nail suspended from a string my father was a frugal man and wasted not a thing when grandpa had to go out back and make his morning call we bundled up the dear old man with a muffler and a shawl i knew the hole on which he sat twas padded all around and once i tried to sit there twas all too wide i found my loins were all too little and i jackknifed there to stay they had to come and get me out or i'd have passed away my father said ambition was a thing that boys should shun and i just used the children's hole till childhood days were done and still i marvel at the craft that cut those holes so true the baby's hole and the slender hole that fitted sister sue that dear old country landmark i tramped around a bit and in the lap of luxury my lot has been to sit but ere i die i'll eat the fruits of trees i robbed of yore then seek the shanty where my name is carved upon the door i ween that old familiar smell will soothe my jaded soul i'm now a man but none the less i'll try the children's hole end of poem this recording is in the public domain a poem on the great exhibition of the industry of all nations to which the vice chancellor's first prize was awarded at the university of dublin by h tilney bassett t c d read for LibriVox.org by josh kibbe of science and the benefits which rise from iron labor and the artist's skill how by the dint of his stern energies man maketh all things subject to his will lifting by slow degrees dark superstition's cloud which covered all the world as with a sable shroud from hence my song a theme sublimer far than feats of chivalry and heroes deed when war's red banner was the meteor star that led her votaries o'er the sanguined field through carnage gory ranks and plunder sword and flame to gain on history's page the title deeds to fame war formed the dream of youth the minstrels lay the laurel wreath the foes in triumph led the people's lot acclaim the pennons gay had o'er its terror such a lustre shed as gilded by their witchery a land's distress the widow's bursting sigh the matron's loneliness in ages fled such was the path to praise scorned were the gifts of peace the bookman's lore men sought not arts which tend the soul to raise nor wisdom gained from learning's goodly store their joy the tinted field their rapture in the fight their noblest aim the spurs which graced the belted knight but lo as beams the first approach of day upon the forehead of the dreamy night checkering each ebb and lock with timid ray until the face of nature gleams with light so progress slowly dawned and from the human mind rolled back the gloomy clouds by which it was confined and as the night wanes o'er some city fair palace and minaret and spire and dome dimly at first seem spectral forms of air striving to pierce the circumambient gloom until each arch and cornice burst upon the sight pranked by the wakened sun with streams of ruddy light touched by her wand thus rose each graceful art and science with its wonder-working train striving to elevate the human heart and wisdom's own imperial heights to gain forever struggling upward through the lowering storm where ignorance presides and error multiform in bright array there marched around her car poet philosopher and learned sage proudly to stem the adverse tide of war raised by foul faction and insensate rage not theirs the blazonry of rank the pomp of power ambition's empty cares which fret their little hour but they were met by obloquy and scorn the loud insulting laugh the gibing sneer thy hero's mighty progress oft have borne with naught but their own genius to cheer by lofty faith in their high destiny endued mid all these venomed shafts they ne'er could be subdued thus israel's sons moved through the teeming flood with dauntless step and hearts devoid of fear 
although the raging waters round them stood and pharaoh's hosts were thundering on their rear they saw the fiery pillar hung by god's own hand the heaven suspended sign that led them to the land but not to those alone be given our song whose minds prolific formed each useful plan fain would the muse in grateful strain prolong the praises of the humble artisan those heritors of toil who with such patient skill produce great schemes of arc and mould them to their will and lo with these there dwells a giant white of iron thews and matchless strength of limb to these his sons he seems with smiles bedight but to the churl he shows a visage grim labor his mighty name no dainty child i trow but though of rugged mien full much doth he bestow by him inspired they delved the wondrous mine fashioned the ruddy ore and brought to light the glittering gem else ever doomed to shine midst hidden caves of simp eternal night by sturdy labor fired they bent the stubborn steel and made the iron mass the ponderous hammer feel they bade the ship along the waters march to waft the treasures of each distant land they raised the column's pride the stately arch all buildings fair by gifted genius planned their work the parthenon and that eternal dome that diadems thy brow all oh, thou imperial rome they hung the arras on the lofty loom bespread the silk with myriad sparkling hues on carpet soft produced the roses bloom the eye to charm and purple warmth diffuse the mirror's silver sheen the couch of lingering ease each rare device they formed that luxury could please what has not genius done with toil combined the electric wires baffle time and space the thundering train outstrips the winged wind that drives the clouds along an eddying race they've changed the river's course the lofty mountains rent and turned to human use each wondrous element heroes have found a herald of their name departed greatness breathes in storied lays tradition's wizard charm records the fame of valor's sons as themes for future praise tells of the eastern plains where lion richard fought of cressy's bloody field and matchless as in court but now a nobler prince demands our song the alfred of a more enlightened age whose praises future poets shall prolong while wisdom finds a place on history's page albert among her sons thy name she shall enroll in glory's foremost rank upon her deathless scroll twas thine the hosts of industry to raise to kindle emulation's sacred fire and bid them to the golden meed of praise bid nations mingled myriads to aspire fame bore the council sage to every distant clime and straight the world's applause approved the scheme sublime swift sailed the willing ships at thy behest big with the trophies of a thousand lands from north and south they came from east and west from iceland's snows from india's burning sands to albion's lovely isle that monarch of the sea where progress sits enthroned in true-born liberty and lo for these a glorious palace rose it seemed the work of some magician's hand or such as poet's vision might disclose raised in the moonbeams by some fairy's wand its walls with crystal gleam upon the ravished sight to rival fancy's dreams and to fill us with delight who poised in air that roof's transparent length rich with the lustre of prismatic dyes who could combine the beauty and the strength which graced the mazes of those galleries see genius smiles elate and points to paxton's name from whose creative mind the crystal marvel came the work achieved behold in regal state begirt by england's chivalry and pride aloft upon her throne victoria sate her blooming children placed on either side ne'er did the world display to monarch such a scene and ne'er was pageant graced by such a virtuous queen no voice was heard until with grace divine the archbishop called the mingled host to prayer then in the hallelujahs loud they join and anthems glorious rolled along the air with waves of melody they swell the sacred song and great jehovah's praise the pealing roofs prolong fain would i now in faithful colors paint the trophied beauties of that matchless place but that the heart amid such scenes grows faint and words seem feeble to express their grace such muse it would require to wing the lofty line as glowed on tassa's lips with fire almost divine here marbles gleaming from the sculptor's hand instinct with life and varied semblance wrought now light and gladsome now sublime and grand are to such wonderful perfection brought that modern genius e'en might claim the stately praise to rival classic art in her most palmy days behold a grecian maid deject forlorn ta'en from her home by some oppressor's hand who like a drooping lily seems to mourn the desolation of her fatherland 
Oh, miracle of skill, methinks the tears will start to tell the silent woe of that poor broken heart. Ah, see the Amazon with arm upraised, grasps in her hand the fatal javelin, as starts her courser back, alarmed, amazed, while a fierce tiger, just an act to spring, glares from its eyeballs death, death from its talons grim, death from the shaggy mane and long extended limb. Here Una's beauty soothes the lion's rage, as sweetly pictured in old Spencer's verse. Here rears the titan's form, Prometheus sage, serenely great beneath the thunderer's curse. Here smiles a gentle maid in youth's sweet gushing prime, and here a giant frowns, grand, awful, and sublime. Turn we to other charms the entranced eyes, where silken trophies in luxuriant flow, gleam with the luster of enameled dyes, bright as the glories which in iris glow, or as the fluckered hues with which the clouds are dight, when first the morning scapes from out the gates of night. Anon a priceless gem demands our gaze, shedding a luster as serene and fair, as some lone star that darts its timid rays in silent beauty through the midnight air. E'en with such silver light thy mellow radiance shone, O oh, matchless Kohinoor, within that crystal zone. And, in the midst of this enchanted hall, a fountain fair dissolves in glistening gems, which in a myriad gushing sparklets fall, as if they were a shower of diadems, like youth's ideal dreams methinks that fountain spray, which glitter for a while to melt an air away. Oh, what a scene now bursts upon the view! What miracles of beauty round us start! Of every shade, device, and form and hue, unparalleled before by human art! What splendid carpets glow! What blazoned pennons wave! Tricked by the dancing sun adown that dazzling nave! And through the hole there flows a breathing tide, a mingled host of people infinite, Children of Europe, blent with Asia's pride, and sons of Africa as swart as night. Rich oriental robes, the Chinese garb grotesque, gleam in that motley throng, piquant and picturesque. Ah, as we gaze where yonder organs rear, some hand has swept the keys, and lo, a sound of floating music steals upon the ear, and straight the roofs reverberate around. Anon the notes are hushed, the lingering murmur dies, in oft-repeated strains of echoed symphonies. And now to other scenes our footsteps stray, lost in the mazes of those long-drawn aisles, well pleased wherever fancy leads the way, our beauty lures us with a thousand wiles, mid luxuries of art and rich profusion blent, which industry and skill from every land have sent. By stately altars now we onward move, by chalice, crucifix, and gleaming bell, by gorgeous vestments bright with golden wove, as if embroidered by some fairy spell, by antique carved work enriched with scroll and flower, wrought in the knotty oak with rare artistic power. Anon we stand within a rich divan, such as a sultan's presence might beseem, bedecked with cushion, shawl and ottoman, and curtains falling in a silken stream. Carpets from Persia's loom, on which the footstep dies, soundless as flakes of snow descend from northern skies. Here cunning goldsmith's work beset with gems is formed in rare device by mimic art. See lofty palm trees rise on golden stems, or laughing dryads from their coppice start, or merry, bounding fawns all wrought in silver sheen, with grinning satyrs glance from out a leafy screen. Now science beckons us to her domain, to view the triumphs of the searching mind, by which her worshippers have learned to gain an empire o'er earth, sea, and fire and wind, have taught the mysteries of nature to obey, and bound them everlastingly beneath their sway. Here engines formed a dart with lightning speed, like strange volcanoes belching fire and smoke, through woods or rivers, bosky plain and mead, through mountains echoing to their laboring stroke, unchecked by obstacles, subduing envious time, to link by kindred bonds each distant place and clime. What endless mazes of machinery, wheels upon wheels that run a ceaseless round, made burnished brass and wondrous tracery, of blending lines on every side abound, these trophies of her power philosophy has brought, produced by patient skill and centuries of thought. And thus has progress a sure triumph won, passing unscathed amid her thousand foes. At length the brighter era has begun than annals of past ages can disclose. The glorious dawn of day has struggled into birth, and industry's brave sons have gained the meat of worth. And now, enchanted paradise, farewell, thy brilliant pageantry, alas, is o'er. The wand is broken, and dissolved the spell, which charmed the nations to fair Albion's shore. The busy hum of praise, the fountain's murmuring spray, are as a tale that's told, a vision passed away. 
but not in vain we trust that goodly sight of nations met in charity and love oh may they never strive to gain the light and use the gifts of wisdom from above oh let the hosts of earth their grateful paeans raise to hail the source of peace jehovah's love to praise praise him ye sons of intellect sublime poet philosopher and learned sage praise him ye votaries of every clime who in the paths of progress would engage oh ho praise his holy name from whom such gifts do flow as tongue can never tell and heart can never know end of poem this recording is in the public domain politics from shapes of clay by ambrose bierce read for LibriVox.org by dale growthman that land full surely hastens to its end where public sycophants in homage bend the populace to flatter and repeat the doubled echoes of its loud conceit lowly their attitude but high their aim they creep to eminence through paths of shame till fixed securely in the seats of power the dupes they flattered they at last devour end of poem this recording is in the public domain regret by olivia ward bush banks read for librivox dot org by phil schempf i said a thoughtless word one day a loved one heard and went away I cried, forgive me, I was blind, I would not wound or be unkind. I waited long, but all in vain, to win my loved one back again, too late, alas, to weep and pray. Death came, my loved one passed away. Then what a bitter fate was mine, no language could my grief define, tears of deep regret could not unsay the thoughtless word I spoke that day. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Remembrance by Eileen Kilmer Read for LibriVox.org by Catherine Miguez I went back to a place I knew when I was very, very small. The same old yellow roses grew against the same old wall. Each thing I knew was in its place. The well, the white stones by the road, the box hedge with its cobweb lace, and a small spotted toad. And yet the place seemed changed and still. The house itself had shrunk, I know. And then my eyes began to fill, for I had always loved it so. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Smile by William Blake Read for LibriVox.org by Phil Schempf There is a smile of love, there is a smile of deceit, and there is a smile of smiles in which these two smiles meet. And there is a frown of hate, and there is a frown of disdain, and there is a frown of frowns which you strive to forget in vain. For it sticks in the heart's deep core, and it sticks in the deep backbone. And no smile that ever was smiled, but only one smile alone. That, betwixt the cradle and grave, it only once smiled can be. And when it once is smiled, there's an end to all misery. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Song for Two in the Night by Edward Murica Translated by Charles Wharton Stork Read for LibriVox.org by Ian King and Newgate Novelist How soft the night wind strokes the meadow grasses And, breathing music, through the woodland passes now that the upstart day is dumb one hears from the still earth a whispering throng of forces animate 
with murmured song joining the zephyr's well attuned hum i catch the tone from wondrous voices brimming which sensuous on the warm wind drifts to me while streaked with misty light uncertainly the very heavens in the glow are swimming the air like woven fabric seems to wave then more transparent and more lustrous groweth meantime a muted melody outgoeth from happy fairies in their purple cave to sphere wrought harmony sing they and busily the thread upon their silver spindles floweth o oh, lovely night how effortless and free o oh, essay might black though green by day thou movest and to the whirring music that thou lovest thy foot advances imperceptibly thus hour by hour thy step doth measure in tranced self-forgetful pleasure thou art rapt creation's soul is rapt with thee end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Song of Vala by William Blake From Vala or the Four Zoas Read for LibriVox.org Here I will sing a song of death. It is a song of Vala. The fallen man takes his repose. You reason slept in the porch. Luva and Vala wake and fly up from the human heart into the brain. From thence upon the pillow Vala slumbered, and Luva seized the horses of light and rose into the chariot of day. Sweet laughter seized me in my sleep, silent and close I laughed, for in the visions of Vala I walked with the mighty fallen one. I heard his voice among the branches and among sweet flowers. Why is the light of Enitharmon darkened in the dewy morn? Why is the silence of Enitharmon a cloud, and her smile a whirlwind? Uttering this darkness in my hall, and in the pillars of my holy ones, why dost thou weep as Vala, and wet thy veil with dewy tears, in slumbers of my night repose infusing a false morning, dividing the female emanations all away from Los? I have refused to look upon the universal vision, and wilt thou slay with death him who devotes himself to thee? If thou drive all the females from Luva, I will drive all the males from thee, born for the sport and amusement of man, now drinking all his powers. I heard the sounding sea, I heard the voice weaker and weaker, the voice came and went like a dream i awoke in my sweet bliss then los smote her upon the earth twas long ere she revived he answered darkening now with indignation hid in smiles i die not enitharmon though thou singest thy song of death nor shalt thou me torment for i behold the fallen man seeking to comfort vala she will not be comforted she rises from his throne and seeks the shadows of her garden weeping for luva lost in bloody beams of your false morning sickening lies the fallen man his head sick his heart faint mighty achievement of your power beware the punishment refusing to behold the divine image which all behold and live thereby he is sunk down into a deadly sleep but we immortal in our own strength survive by stern debate till we have drawn the lamb of god into a mortal form 
and that he must be born is certain for one must be all and comprehend within himself all things both small and great we therefore for whose sake all things aspire to be and live will so receive the divine image that among the reprobate he may be devoted to destruction from his mother's womb mighty achievement of your power beware the punishment i see the invisible knife descending into the gardens of vala luva walking upon the winds i see the invisible knife i see the showers of blood i see the swords and spears of futurity though in the brain of man we live and in his circling nerves though this bright world of all our joy is in the human brain where you reason and all his hosts hang their immortal lamps thou never shalt leave this cold expanse where watery tharmas mourns so spoke los scorn and indignation rose upon anatharmon then anatharmon reddening fierce stretched her immortal hands descend o oh, you reason descend with horse and chariot threaten me not o oh, visionary these the punishment the human nature shall no more remain nor human acts form the rebellious spirits of heaven but war and princedom victory and blood night darkened as she spoke a shuddering ran from east to west a groan was heard on high the warlike clarion ceased the spirits of luva and vala shuddered in their orb an orb of blood eternity groaned and was troubled at the image of eternal death the wandering man bowed his faint head and you reason descended and the one must have murdered the man if he had not descended indignant muttering low thunders you reason descended gloomy sounding now i am god from eternity to eternity end of poem this recording is in the public domain Sonnet ninety one by William Shakespeare. Read for LibriVox.org by Phil Schempf. Some glory in their birth, some in their skill, some in their wealth, some in their body's force, some in their garments, though new fangled ill, some in their hawks and hounds, some in their horse. And every humor hath his adjunct pleasure, wherein it finds a joy above the rest but these particulars are not my measure all these i better in one general best thy love is better than high birth to me richer than wealth prouder than garments cost of more delight than hawks and horses be and having thee of all men's pride i boast wretched in this alone that thou mayest take all this away and me most wretched make End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Spring by Edna St. Vincent Millay Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter To what purpose, April, do you return again? Beauty is not enough. You can no longer quiet me with the redness of little leaves opening stickily. I know what I know. The sun is hot on my neck as I observe the spikes of the crocus. The smell of the earth is good. It is apparent that there is no death. But what does that signify? Not only underground are the brains of men eaten by maggots. Life in itself is nothing. An empty cup a flight of uncarpeted stairs. It is not enough that yearly, down this hill, April, comes like an idiot, babbling and strewing flowers. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Strange Meeting by Wilfred Owen Read for LibriVox.org by William Esqueda It seemed that out of battle I escaped Down some profound dull tunnel Long since scooped through caverns Which titanic wars had groined Yet also their encumbered sleepers groaned Too fast in sleep or death to be bestirred Then as I probed them one sprang up and stared with piteous recognition in fixed eyes lifting distressful hands as if to bless and by a smile i knew that sullen hall by his dead smile i knew we stood in hell with a thousand pains that vision's face was grained yet no blood reached there from the upper ground and no guns whooped or down the flues made moan strange friend i said here is no cause to mourn none said the other save the undone years the hopelessness whatever hope is yours was my hope also i went hunting wild after the wildest beauty in the world which lies not calm in eyes or braided hair but mocks the steady running of the hour and if it grieves grieves richer than here for of my glee might many men have laughed and of my weeping something had been left which now must die I mean the truth untold, the pity of war, the pity war distilled. Now men will go content with what we spoiled, or discontent, boil bloody and be spilled. They will be swift with swiftness of the tigress. None will break ranks, though nations trek from progress. Courage was mine, and I had mystery. Wisdom was mine, and I had mastery to miss the march of this retreating world into vain citadels that are not walled. Then, when much blood has clogged the chariot wheels, I would go up and wash them from sweet wells. Even with truths that lie too deep for taint, I would have poured my spirit without stint. But now, through wounds, not on the cess of war, foreheads of men have bled where no wounds were. I am the enemy you killed, my friend. I knew you in this dark, for so you frowned. Yesterday through me as you jab and killed. I parried, but my hands were loath and cold. Let us sleep now. This recording is in the public domain. Sunset by H. P. Lovecraft Read for LibriVox.org by Flamboyant Otter The cloudless day is richer at its close, A golden glory settles on the lea, Soft stealing shadows hint of cool repose, To mellowing landscape and to calming sea. And in that nobler, gentler, lovelier light, The soul to sweeter, loftier bliss inclines, Freed from noonday glare, the favored sight, Increasing grace in earth and sky divines, but ere the purest radiance crowns the green, or fairest luster fills the expectant grove, the twilight thickens, and the fleeting scene leaves but a hallowed memory of love. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To a Dreamer by H. P. Lovecraft. Read for LibriVox.org by Flamboyant Otter. I scan thy features, calm and white, Beneath the single taper's light, Thy dark-fringed lids, behind whose screen Are eyes that view not earth's demean. And as I look, I fain would know The paths whereon thy dream-steps go, The spectral realms that thou canst see, With eyes veiled from the world and me. For I have likewise gazed in sleep On things my memory scarce can keep, And from half-knowing long to spy Again the scenes before thine eye. I too have known the peaks of Thok, The vales of Nath where dream shapes flock, The vaults of Zin and well I trove, Why thou demand'st that taper's glow? But what is this that subtly slips Over thy face and bearded lips? What fear distracts thy mind and heart That drops must from thy forehead start? Old vision wake thine opening eyes, Gleam black with clouds of other skies, and from some demoniac sight I flee into the haunted night. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
The Toiling of Felix by Henry Van Dyke. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. The Toiling of Felix, a legend on a new saying of Jesus. In the rubbish heaps of the ancient city of Oxenrinkus, near the river Nile, a party of English explorers in the winter of 1897 discovered a fragment of a papyrus book written in the second or third century and hitherto unknown this single leaf contained parts of seven short sentences of christ each introduced by the words jesus says it is to the fifth of these sayings of jesus that the following poem refers the toiling of felix one prelude here a word that jesus spake nineteen hundred years ago where the crimson lilies blow round the blue tiberian lake where the bread of life he brake through the fields of harvest walking with his lowly comrades talking of the secret thoughts that feed weary souls in time of need art thou hungry come and take hear the word that jesus spake tis the sacrament of labor bread and wine divinely blessed friendship's food and sweet refreshment strength and courage joy and rest but this word the master said long ago and far away silent and forgotten lay buried with the silent dead where the sands of egypt spread sea-like tawny billows heaping over ancient cities sleeping while the river nile between rolls its summer flood of green rolls its autumn flood of red there the word the master said written on a frail papyrus wrinkled scorched by fire and torn hidden by god's hand was waiting for its resurrection morn now at last the buried word by the delving spade is found sleeping in the quiet ground now the call of life is heard rise again and like a bird fly abroad on wings of gladness through the darkness and the sadness of the toiling age and sing sweeter than the voice of spring till the hearts of men are stirred by the music of the word gospel for the heavy laden answer to the laborer's cry raise the stone and thou shalt find me cleave the wood and there am i two legend brother men who look for jesus long to see him close and clear hearken to the tale of felix how he found the master near born in egypt neath the shadow of the crumbling gods of night he forsook the ancient darkness turned his young heart toward the light seeking christ in vain he waited for the vision of the lord vainly pondered many volumes where the creeds of men were stored vainly shut himself in silence keeping vigil night and day vainly haunted shrines and churches where the christians came to pray one by one he dropped the duties of the common life of care broke the human ties that bound him laid his spirit waste and bare hoping that the lord would enter that deserted dwelling place and reward the loss of all things with the vision of his face still the blessed vision tarried still the night was unrevealed still the master dim and distant kept his countenance concealed fainter grew the hope of finding wearier grew the fruitless quest prayer and penitence and fasting gave no comfort brought no rest lingering in the darkened temple ere the lamp of faith went out felix knelt before the altar lonely sad and full of doubt hear me o my lord and master from the altar's tep he cried let my one desire be granted let my hope be satisfied only once i long to see thee in the fullness of thy grace break the clouds that now enfold thee with the sunrise of thy face all that men desire and treasure have i counted loss for thee every hope have i forsaken save this one my lord to see loose the sacred bands of friendship solitary stands my heart thou shalt be my sole companion when i see thee as thou art from thy distant throne in glory flash upon my inward sight fill the midnight of my spirit with the splendor of thy light all thine other gifts and blessings common mercies i disown separated from my brothers i would see thy face alone 
I have watched, and I have waited as one waiteth for the morn. Still the veil is never lifted, still thou leavest me forlorn. Now I seek thee in the desert where the holy hermits dwell. There beside the saint Serapion I will find a lonely cell. There at last thou wilt be gracious. There thy presence long concealed in the solitude and silence to my heart shall be revealed. Thou wilt come at dawn or twilight, or the rolling waves of sand. I shall see thee close beside me. I shall touch thy pierced hand. Lo, thy pilgrim kneels before thee. Bless my journey with a word. Tell me now that if I follow I shall find thee, O my Lord. Felix, listen. Through the darkness, like a murmur of the wind, came a gentle sound of stillness. Never faint and thou shalt find. Long and toilsome was his journey through the heavy land of heat, Egypt's blazing sun above him, blistering sand beneath his feet. Patiently he plodded onward, and from the pathway never erred, till he reached the river headland called the Mountain of the Bird. There the tribes of air assemble once a year, their noisy flock, then departing leave a sentinel perched upon the highest rock. Far away on joyful pinions, over land and sea they fly, but the watcher on the summit lonely stands against the sky. There the Aramite Serapion in a cave had made his bed. There the faithful bands of pilgrims sought his blessing, brought him bread. Month by month in deep seclusion, hidden in the rocky cleft, dwelt the hermit, fasting, praying. Once a year the cave he left. On that day a happy pilgrim, chosen out of all the band, won a special sign of favor from the holy hermit's hand. Underneath the narrow window at the doorway closely sealed, while the afterglow of sunset deepened round him, Felix kneeled. Man of God, of men most holy, thou whose gifts cannot be priced, grant me thy most precious guerdon, tell me how to find the Christ. Breathless, Felix bent and listened, but no answering voice he heard. Darkness folded, dumb and death-like, round the mountain of the bird. Then he said, The saint is silent. He would teach my soul to wait. I will tarry here in patience like a beggar at his gate. Near the dwelling of the hermit Felix found a rude abode, and a shallow tomb deserted close beside the pilgrim road. So the faithful pilgrim saw him waiting there without complaint. Soon they learned to call him holy, fed him as they fed the saint. Day by day he watched the sunrise flood the distant plain with gold, while the river Nile beneath him silvery coiling seaward rolled. Night by night he saw the planets range their glittering court on high, saw the moon with queenly motion mount her throne and rule the sky. Morn advanced and midnight fled, in visionary pomp attired. Never morn and never midnight brought the vision long desired. Now at last the day is dawning where Serapion makes his gift. Felix kneels before the threshold, hardly dares his eyes to lift. Now the cavern door uncloses. Now the saint above him stands, blesses him without a word, and leaves a token in his hands. Tis the guerdon of thy waiting, Look, thou happy pilgrim, look, nothing but a tattered fragment of an old papyrus book. Read, perchance the clue to guide thee hidden in the words may lie. Raise the stone, and thou shalt find me, cleave the wood, and there am I. Can it be the mighty master spake such simple words as these? Can it be that men must seek him at their toil mid rocks and trees? Disappointed, heavy-hearted, from the mountain of the bird, Felix mournfully descended, questioning the master's word. Not for him a sacred dwelling far above the haunts of men. He must turn his footsteps backward to the common life again. From a quarry near the river, hollowed out amid the hills, rose the clattering voice of labor, clanking hammers, clinking drills. Dust and noise and hot confusion made a babel of the spot. There, among the lowliest workers, Felix sought and found his lot. Now he swung the ponderous mallet, smote the iron in the rock. 
muscles quivering, tingling, throbbing, blow on blow and shock on shock. Now he drove the willow wedges, wet them till they swelled and split with their silent strength. The fragments sent it thundering down the pit. Now the groaning tackle raised it, now the rollers made it slide. Harnessed men like beasts of burden drew it to the riverside. Now the palm trees must be riven, massive timbers hewn and dressed rafts to bear the stones in safety on the rushing river's breast. Axe and auger, saw and chisel, wrought the will of man and wood. Mid the many-handed labor, Felix toiled and found it good. Every day the blood ran fleeter through his limbs, and round his heart every night he slept the sweeter, knowing he had done his part. Dreams of solitary saintship faded from him, but instead came a sense of daily comfort in the toil for daily bread. Far away, across the river, gleamed the white walls of the town, whither all the stones and timbers day by day were floated down. There the workman saw his labor taking form and bearing fruit, like a tree with splendid branches rising from a humble root. Looking at the distant city, temples, houses, domes, and towers, Felix cried in exultation, All that mighty work is ours! Every toiler in the quarry, every builder on the shore, every chopper in the palm grove, every raspman at the oar, hewing wood and drawing water, splitting stones and cleaving sod, all the dusty ranks of labor in the regiment of God. March together toward his triumph, do the task his hands prepare. Honest toil is holy service, faithful work is praise and prayer. While he bore the heat and burden, Felix felt the sense of rest, flowing softly like a fountain deep within his weary breast. Felt the brotherhood of labor rising round him like a tide, overflow his heart and join him to the workers at his side. Oft he cheered them with his singing at the breaking of the light, told them tales of Christ at noonday, taught them words of prayer at night. Once he bent over a comrade fainting in the midday heat, sheltered him with woven palm leaves, gave him water cool and sweet. Then it seemed for one swift moment secret radiance filled the place. Underneath the green palm branches flashed a look of Jesus' face. Once again a raftsman slipping plunged beneath the stream and sank. Swiftly Felix leaped to rescue, caught him, drew him toward the bank. Battling with the cruel river, using all his strength to save, did he dream? Or was there one beside him walking on the way? Now, at last, the work was ended. Grove deserted, quarry stilled. Felix journeyed to the city that his hands had helped to build. In the darkness of the temple, the closing hour of day, as of old he sought the altar, as of old he knelt to pray. Hear me, O thou hidden master. Thou hast sent a word to me. It is written, thy commandment. I have kept it faithful. Thou hast to bid me leave the visions of the solitary life. Bear my part in human labor, take my share in human strife. I have done thy bidding, master. Raised the rock and felled the tree, swung the axe and plied the hammer, working every day for thee. Once it seemed I saw thy presence through the bending palm leaves gleam. Once upon the flowing water, nay, I know not, t'was a dream. This I know. Thou hast been near me. More than this I dare not ask. Though I see thee not, I love thee. Let me do thy humblest task. Through the dimness of the temple slowly dawned a mystic light. There the master stood in glory, manifest to mortal sight. Hands that bore the mark of labor, brow that bore the print of care. Hands of power divinely tender, brow of light divinely fair. Hearken, good and faithful servant, true disciple, loyal friend. Thou hast followed me and found me. I will keep thee to the end. Well, I know thy toil and trouble, often weary, fainting, worn. I have lived the life of labor, heavy burdens I have borne. Never in a prince's palace have I slept on golden bed. Never in a hermit's cavern have I eaten unearned bread. Born within a lowly stable where the cattle round me stood, trained a carpenter in Nazareth, 
I have toiled and found it good. They who tread the path of labor follow where my feet have trod. They who work without complaining do the holy will of God. Where the many toil together, there am I among my own. Where the tired workman sleepeth, there am I with him alone. I, the peace that passeth knowledge, dwell amid the daily strife. I, the bread of heaven, am broken in the sacrament of life. Every task, however simple, sets the soul that does it free. Every deed of love and mercy done to man is done to me. Thou hast learned the open secret. Thou hast come to me for rest. With thy burden in thy labor, thou art Felix doubly blessed. Nevermore thou needest seek me. I am with thee everywhere. Raise the stone, and thou shalt find me. Cleave the wood, and I am there. 3. Envoy The legend of Felix is ended. The toiling of Felix is done. The master has paid him his wages. The goal of his journey is won. He rests, but he never is idle. A thousand years pass like a day. In the glad surprise of that paradise where work is sweeter than play. Yet often the king of that country comes out from his tireless toast and walks in this world of the weary as if he loved it the most. For here, in the dusty confusion, with eyes that are heavy and dim, he meets again the laboring men who are looking and longing for him. He cancels the curse of Eden and brings them a blessing instead. Blessed are they that labor, for Jesus partakes of their bread. He puts his hand to their burdens. He enters their homes at night. Who does his best shall have as guest the master of life and light. And courage will come with his presence, and patience return at his touch. And manifold sins be forgiven to those who love him much. The cries of envy and anger will change to the songs of cheer. The toiling age will forget its rage when the Prince of Peace draws near. This is the gospel of labor. Ring it, ye bells of the kirk. The Lord of love came down from above to live with men who work. This is the rose that he planted here in the throne-cursed soil. Heaven is blessed with perfect rest, but the blessing of earth is toil. 1898 End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To Plead My Faith by Robert Devereux, Second Earl of Essex, read for LibriVox.org by Cleve Callison, Wilmington, North Carolina, March 30th, 2019. To plead my faith where faith hath no reward, to move remorse where favor is not born, to heap complaints where she doth not regard, were fruitless, bootless, vain, and yield but scorn. I love at her whom all the world admired. I was refused of her that can love none. And my vain hopes, which far too high aspired, is dead and buried and forever gone. Forget my name, since you have scorned my love, and womanlike do not too late lament, since for your sake I do all mischief prove. I none accuse, nor nothing do repent. I was as fond as ever she was fair, yet loved I not more than I now despair. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To the Marquis Lafayette by John G. C. Brainard. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. To the Marquis Lafayette. We'll search the earth and search the sea to cull a gallant wreath for thee and every field for freedom fought and every mountain height where aught of liberty can yet be found shall be our blooming harvest ground laurels in garlands hang upon thermopylae and marathon on bannockburn the thistle grows on runny mead the wild rose blows and on the banks of boyne its leaves Green Erin's shamrock wildly weaves. In France, in sunny France, we'll get the fleur de lis and mignonette from every consecrated spot where lies a martyred Huguenot. 
and cull even here from many a field and many a rocky height bays that our vales and mountains yield where men have met to fight for law and liberty and life and died in freedom's holy strife below atlantic seas below the waves of erie and champlain the sea-grass and the corals grow in rostral trophies round the slain and we can add to form thy crown some branches worthy thy renown long may the chaplet flourish bright and borrow from the heavens its light as with a cloud that circles round a star when other stars have set with glory shall thy brow be bound with glory shall thy head be crowned with glory star-like cinctured yet for earth and air and sky and sea shall yield a glorious wreath to thee end of poem this recording is in the public domain Vashti's Song by Arthur Quiller Couch Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Vashti's Song Over the rim of the moor And under the starry sky Two men came to my door And rested them thereby Beneath the bough and the star In a whispering foreign tongue They talked of a land afar And the merry days so young Beneath the dawn and the bough, I heard them arise and go, and my heart it is aching now, for the more it will never know. Why did they two depart before I could understand? Where lies that land, O oh my heart, O oh my heart, where lies that land? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Waking from Drunkenness on a Spring Day by Lee Bai Read for LibriVox.org by April 6090, California, United States of America Waking from Drunkenness on a Spring Day Life in the world is but a big dream. I will not spoil it by any labor or care. So saying, I was drunk all the day. Lying helpless at the porch in front of my door, when I woke up, I blinked at the garden lawn. A lonely bird was singing amid the flowers. I asked myself, had the day been wet or fine? The spring wind was telling the mango bird. Moved by its song, I soon began to sigh. And as wine was there, I filled my own cup. Wildly singing, I waited for the moon to rise. When my song was over, all my senses had gone. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. We Are Seven by William Wordsworth Read for LibriVox.org by Melissa Jane Memphis, Tennessee A simple child that lightly draws its breath And feels its life in every limb What should it know of death? I met a little cottage girl she was eight years old, she said. Her hair was thick with many a curl that clustered round her head. She had a rustic woodland air, and she was wildly clad. Her eyes were fair and very fair. Her beauty made me glad. Sisters and brothers, little maid, how many may you be? How many? Seven in all she said, and wondering, looked at me. And where are they, I pray you tell? She answered, Seven are we, and two of us at Conway dwell, and two are gone to sea. Two of us in the churchyard lie, my sister and my brother, and in the churchyard cottage I dwell near them with my mother. You say that two at Conway dwell, and two are gone to sea. Yet ye are seven, I pray you tell, sweet maid, how this may be. Then did the little maid reply, 
Seven boys and girls are we. Two of us in the churchyard lie beneath the churchyard tree. You run about, my little maid. Your limbs, they are alive. If two are in the churchyard laid, then ye are only five. Their graves are green. They may be seen, the little maid replied. Twelve steps or more from my mother's door, and they are side by side. My stockings there I often knit, my kerchief there I hem, and there upon the ground I sit and sing a song to them. And often after sunset, sir, when it is light and fair, I take my little porringer and eat my supper there. The first that died was Sister Jane. In bed she moaning lay, till God released her of her pain, and then she went away. So in the churchyard she was laid, and when the grass was dry, together round her grave we played, my brother John and I. And when the ground was white with snow, and I could run and slide, my brother John was forced to go, and he lies by her side. How many are you then? said I. If they two are in heaven. Quick, was the little maid's reply. Oh, master, we are seven. But they are dead. Those two are dead. Their spirits are in heaven. Twas throwing words away. For still the little maid would have her will. And say, Nay, we are seven. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Where the Picnic Was by Thomas Hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Quaker Woodworker Where we made the fire in the summertime of branch and briar on the hill to the sea, I slowly climb through winter mire and scan and trace the forsaken place quite readily. Now a cold wind blows, and the grass is gray, but the spot still shows as a burnt circle. I and stick ends charred still strew the sward whereon I stand. Last relic of the band who came that day. Yes, I am here just as last year, And the sea breathes brine From its strange straight line up hither, The same as when we four came. But two have wandered far From this grassy rise into urban roar Where no picnics are, And one has shut her eyes forevermore. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Without Ceremony by Thomas Hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Quaker Woodworker Without Ceremony It was your way, my dear, to be gone without a word when callers, friends, or kin had left and I hastened in to rejoin you, as I inferred. And when you'd a mind to career off anywhere, say to town, you were all on a sudden gone before I had thought thereon, or noticed your trunks were down. So, now that you disappear forever in that swift style, your meaning seems to me just as it used to be. Goodbye is not worth while. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.